part of our session this morning. Um, today, now we have two, two speakers. Uh, so Jim Gates, hello Jim, it's a pleasure to see you. I'm Karen Holberg here, nice to see you. Uh, albeit, nice to see you. Albeit virtually, it would have been nice to have you here, but we understand and it's very so nice at least to have you uh, on Zoom. So thank you for being there. Jim Gates, uh, he's a professor at the and researcher at the University of Maryland in the US. And he uh, was a former president uh, of, the, of the APS, so until quite recently. And uh, Jim was always very active also in, in uh, diversity and inclusion issues, so now we'll, we'll hear from him. And the second talk will be by uh, Valeria Vivas. She's from Argentina, and she's a co-founder of XTEM, um, which, uh, search, which uh, searches and looks for uh, promoting uh, uh, stimulates promoting participation of uh, of uh, women and other diversities uh, in in um, uh, in STEM careers. So uh, so well, Jim, uh, the floor is yours. So welcome, and uh, we're here we are to listen to you. Thank you very much. I uh, would like to begin by thanking uh, Nathan and all the organizers, yourself included, uh, for this opportunity. Uh, I have to apologize, as you know, I, I had an injury to my uh, ankle while I was in South Africa this summer, so I'm still recovering, but I still have some mobility challenges, which is why I'm not there in person. Okay, so uh, I was, Nathan basically uh, asked me to give this particular talk where I discuss what I have lived essentially on the boundaries of science, of barriers, and diversity. So let's get started. I like to start with mom and dad. Uh, this is a picture of my father taken in 1962, a picture of my mom in 1942, and they're really the foundation for my STEM career, like most of us. Uh, my dad was in the U.S. Army for 25 years. My mother was a, sort of an artistic person. She crocheted, she did uh, color, watercolors, fire clay figurines, and that sort of thing. So I have these two very diverse parents in terms of their interests. Uh, when I was uh, about to be born, we were living in Florida and Tampa. And in those days, African-Americans could not go to public hospitals to get uh, medical services. So I wound up being born in a uh, what's called a, uh, a benefit, a benevolent society. In Orlando, there's a benevolent society. Back in those days, when African-Americans couldn't get services, uh, the groups of people would band together save their money and build the facilities for themselves. So theaters, uh, hospitals, what have you. And in the lower uh, lower right-hand corner here, you can see the a picture of the hospital that was born in 1950. Uh, now, 1950 is around the time of the second of the uh, Korean War. And the picture that you see here, the, bill, min, min, the, the gentleman in the middle of this picture, Isaac Woodard, was a soldier in World War II. Uh, but he was from the South in the United States. And when he came back to the U.S. while he was trying to get home, um, a bus driver asked him to move to the rear of the bus. He didn't do so. And so when they got to the next town, the bus driver had the sheriff arrest him. And the sheriff took him to the jail and beat him so badly uh, that he was blinded. This is a picture of Mr. Woodard uh, in the center. Now, you might wonder what this has to do with my story. So let me now get to that part. So this story made its way back to President Harry Truman. And Harry Truman, 1950, as I said, uh, 1950s, the uh, Korean War is being fought. And so uh, for this reason uh, and others, uh, Harry Truman, and especially under the pressure of the Korean War, decided that the United States military would no longer be segregated. Up to that point, uh, African-Americans could not serve along with European-Americans in the same companies. So uh, because of Harry Truman's or order, it meant that when I was four years old, I was living in Canada. My father was stationed here at a army base called Fort Pepperell. You can see some pictures on the screen, the pictures of the harbor. This was the main headquarters building. And up in the hills here, they had uh, housing for residential families. So that's where I was living from uh, 1953 to 1956. Um, my mother took me to see a movie one day. And that movie is called Space Waves. It's a science fiction movie. I was four years old. And although I don't remember it, uh, my parents used to tell me that after seeing that movie, that evening I told my father I wanted to become a scientist. In 1956, our family returned from Canada to the United States. 
And on this side, you can see a picture of the type of plane this, that we flew in. This was not uh, the plane itself, but this was the kind of plane that we flew back on. And to the left of this, you can see the actual flight manifest with all the names of my family, uh, along with other passengers on this plane. Uh, this is me, <laughs> excuse me, as a second grader, uh, still bright eyed and cheery and trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life, but I knew I wanted to be a scientist. Um, however, I was having trouble in school. So my father remembered that his four year old son uh, had uh, been interested in science. And so he brought home some books. These are the covers of the books. And because of my interest in science, I was I overcame my challenges in terms of learning to read and write. Unfortunately, in 1962, a tragedy happened to our family. My mother, my biological mother, died, and so this was in San Antonio, uh, Texas, where this uh, actually where she had been raised uh, as a child, and we were actually living there uh, when she died. But uh, a year later, my father remarried, and my stepmother. Uh, lived in Orlando, Florida. That meant that I spent all of my high school years uh, in Orlando, which is interesting when you look back at my life, because remember I told you, the U.S. military was desegregated. So for the first 11 and a half years of my life, I grew up in communities where there were all sorts of ethnicities. There were African Americans, European American, Asian Americans, Hispanic Americans, and we were all just kids together, uh, as I said, uh, learning to play and starting school. But when we moved, we moved to Orlando, and in Orlando, uh, it was a African. It was a segregated community. There was one high school in Orlando where African Americans could get uh, secondary education. It's called Jones High School, and so that's where I spent grades uh, seven through twelve. Uh, I was also reading comic books, which actually was very important because uh, because of my mother's death. Uh, escapes uh, to read comic books and science fiction were very important for my mental health. And I recognized that at the time. So this is a cover of, the, of one of my favorite set of characters called the Fantastic Four. And this particular uh, issue, you can see the character above called the Black Panther. If any of you uh, watch these Marvel movies these days, you, you know these characters. But back in the 60s, they were only in comic books. But the neat thing for me was the leader of the Fantastic Four was a scientist. Richard Reed was so his uh, imaginary name. I'm pointing to him. They had lots and lots of interesting characters. Uh, here's the Black Panther again. The Black Panther being the first black superhero that had, was ever appeared in any comic book. The characters over here are actually uh, another uh, set of heroes. And even in the 60s, Stan Lee, who was the main writer for Marvel Comics, was concerned about things uh, in our society. So it was his initiative that introduced this Black uh, character, superhero, uh, into the Marvel comic books. Here's another book he wrote about, The Hate Monger, which was a villain that had a ray gun that when he would point the ray gun and pull the trigger, uh, people who exposed to the rays would start to hate. I tell people that this is really very interesting because these days, we have such a technology. It's called fake news on the web. People hate because of what they see and hear, uh, not necessarily grounded in reality, but uh, certainly has a huge impact on our society. These are my some of my teachers. Miss Weaver, Miss Delma Dudley were my English teachers. Miss Edna Williams was my geometry teacher. I tell people she was my first drill instructor in logic. Mr. William Saunders taught me algebra too. Mr. Reuben Patrick was my French teacher. I took French while I was in high school. But most of all, the most important teacher in my life was Mr. Freeman Coney, who you can see down in the right-hand corner. Uh, when I was 14, I heard about this place. Now, remember, I told you I was four years old, claiming I wanted to be a scientist. And I was reading science fiction and reading about superheroes where the heroes that I admired most were scientists. And so at 14, I learned about the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And uh, that evening when my father asked the question, what college do you want to go to, which is the question he always asks us at dinner, uh, I had an answer that day. It was MIT. Um, wow, but while uh, we were in high school, we formed a chess club. This is a picture of the Joan Ty's first chess club. And uh, it started when this guy here, Philip Dunn, a close friend of mine, taught me how to play chess. And we uh, used to have these epic matches. And so we, after a while, friends would gather around to watch. And so we formed a chess club. 
And this chess club actually taught me something very interesting besides chess. You see, Jones High was the only high school in Orlando where African Americans could get a degree. And so when we formed our chess club, we thought we were pretty good. And so we challenged all the other high schools uh, in Orlando that had chess teams uh, to matches. Now, they would never come to our high school because, after all, we're the black high school, and I'll talk about the living situations there in a little while. So we always had to go visit their high schools for our matches. We never lost a chess match, which was shocking for our host because we actually were very good at chess. We had some very intense self-training. But for me, it opened up an entirely different view of what, how the you know, U.S. society actually works. This is a map of old Orlando around the time I lived there. And uh, I don't know how many of you have been to, have been to uh, Orlando and perhaps downtown Disney World. Uh, I'm in downtown Orlando or Disney World. But where my cursor is showing over here, this is downtown Orlando, the location. To the west of this, this area here, is where the African-American community uh, was uh, existing. And so uh, it was in Orlando that I first really understood the meaning of racism. Now, how did that work? Well, um, so my parents' home, th this is a highway that had came in and took down the house. But when I was living, our parents' home were here. And I worked at the library and this high schools that we would go to for challenge were all on this side. And what I noticed was at these other high schools, they had, they had, each student had a separate book. Uh, all the desks had uh, desktops, so you didn't have just a seat by itself. Uh, the the um, conditions of the, of the high schools were much better than mine. And so I then understood um, from these chess matches that in the United States, if you were an African-American kid, that the society as a whole was betting against you was the expression I used because the things that you had to learn and further your education were not comparable to the things that other kids had access to. I, I recently described this as a little bit like in uh, going to school, I came to realize that I was being taught how to do uh, the backstroke, but the kids on this side of the dividing line were learning how to do freestyle. And that life would be a race, and if I uh, if if I followed the the path that our society had set out for me, it would not be a race that would take me to my dream of becoming a scientist. So it was this is where I got a PhD in understanding the impact of race uh, in uh, the United States society. However, I was a studious kid and uh, wound up being the uh, valedictorian of my class. This is a picture of me uh, in our high school yearbook. Um, <clears throat> and I told you that I had learned about MIT. However, I almost didn't apply. Um, I had taken the uh, SAT, the Scholastic Achievement Test, and other tests, te standardized tests, and I had done okay on most of them, but I had a really good physics score. And that was because of Mr. Freeman Coney, the teacher I indicated to you before. Um, he, so I started getting letters from universities in 1969. 1969 was the first year when the majority of universities in the United States decided that it was okay to admit African-American students. Now, at MIT, the first African-American student had been admitted back in the 1890s, but they had never admitted more than one or two or often none uh, in entering classes. In my entering class, it would turn out that that changed. However, as I was very much aware of how racism works and uh, is realized in American society, even to this day, even, and even though I had this dream of going to MIT, when I got the letter from MIT, I ignored it because I knew, or at least I thought I knew, that I would never have a chance to be fairly considered for admission to such a place. Well, my father <laughs> remembered at age 14 that I had talked about applying there. And uh, dad had spent, uh, like I said, 25 years in the U.S. Army. And so uh, when he suggested something, you know, the father's word ruled the household. So he said, look, this is what you said you wanted. Go ahead and apply. All they can do is say no, but you should at least try. So he actually forced me 
to apply to MIT, which was the thing I had been dreaming about for about three or four years prior to that. So to my very great surprise, and because MIT had basically decided to start uh, what we came formally to know as affirmative action programs, uh, my admissions occurred. Now at MIT was not, not simple. And I like to show this uh, in this particular slide, especially when I talk to students, because students, I used to give this talk without this slide, and students would often come up to me after and say, whoa, your life is all set out, it was all so easy. And I said, no, 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 you don't understand, it was not easy. So when I got to MIT, uh, I had a lot of trouble taking tests. Uh, I would sit uh, when an exam, 20 minutes would go by, nothing's in my paper. And then finally, I would start thinking about it a little bit and writing it down. <laughs> And then so by the end of the hour, all the other students had an hour long test. I had a 40 minute long test. And that means I was never able to demonstrate what I really knew on the exams. This built up a lot of emotional stress. And I, I quite frankly, I wept uh, disconsolately. It was extraordinarily painful because it seemed as though my dream that I had fostered for well over a decade was going to die. And to me, the death of a dream, it almost feels like the death of a person. And so all of this negative emotions, I, I had to figure out what to do with. And in my case, it turned out there's a, there's a game called bowling, and I learned to bowl. And so when I would start to really feel bad about myself, I would go bowl three, six, nine, 12 games in a row. So that by the time that I graduated from MIT, I was on the championship bowling team. That shows you that I never really got better at tests, but I sure got better at bowling. In 1975, I was in graduate school then at, uh, at MIT because I graduated in uh, undergraduate in 73. But in 75, I was teaching during the summer. And in fact, this is a picture of me teaching a calculus class. I didn't know this picture existed until a few years ago when a friend pointed it out. But when I saw it, I realized immediately what I was doing by looking at the board. I was teaching about limits that day. But as you can see, I was quite comfortable, uh, a rather unconventional appearing teacher, I suspect. This was a friend of mine named Ronald McNair in graduate school. Some of you may recognize his name. It's certainly recognizable in the United States because he's the African-American astronaut who died when the space shuttle uh, exploded in 1985. Ron was a PhD uh, laser physicist. In fact, he was a close friend of mine. We had studied together, we had partied together, had a great time. And so when he, from those experiences, he knew that uh, that the thing that had interested me in science was actually space travel. So uh, even though I got my PhD in 1977, and I wrote the first thesis on a subject called supersymmetry, which has been a major, uh, has been a major force in theoretical particle physics, uh, essentially for the last uh, 40, almost 50 years now, but in those days, no one at MIT knew anything about the subject except one graduate student. That was me. And so it was very curious and interesting to, uh, during our thesis defense. I, so I got my thesis. Here I am on graduation day. But while I was defending it, uh, this gentleman, Ernie Moniz, who um, would later go on to uh, serve as uh, President Obama's Secretary of Energy, and is currently still a professor at MIT, was on my thesis defense committee. And so, as I told you, I was the only person at MIT who knew anything about what I was doing. So that made the thesis defense very, very simple from my perspective. And uh, in 2013, uh, you know, there's a link here, as you can see on this page, but you can hear uh, Professor Moniz says it was the best thesis defense he had seen in physics. So even though I had little guidance, I apparently have done a good job and uh, uh, studying um, something related to this picture. Um, I'm a physicist, so in particular, I study elementary particles. And so what I've shown you here are all the elementary particles that we know um, that we know in nature, including the Higgs boson represented by this little uh, circle over here. But what was special about supersymmetry was when I read the first papers on it, I realized that it implied that our universe might look like this. In other words, there might be new forms of matter and energy that no one had ever dreamt could exist before. 
And so this excited me tremendously. And that's why I chose supersymmetry as my topic to study, even though none of the faculty members knew anything about it, no other graduate students were interested. I was just convinced that the opportunities here were so great that it would be foolish to overlook them. And fortunately for me, um, I was right in that, that uh, young person's judgment. After MIT, I was off to Harvard. I spent three years uh, as a junior fellow there. Uh, met some very interesting people like Edward Witten, who's an uh, extremely well-known uh, fundamental physicist. Mike Peskin was my office mate. And I met some other people that we'll talk about in a moment. I started going to conferences. This is a conference, a Nuffield conference at Cambridge. And I'm sure most of your audience recognizes the gentleman sitting in front, that's Stephen Hawking. And so I first met Stephen um, in 1980. I thought he was the bravest physicist I had ever seen because even though he was confined to a wheelchair, he, um, at the end of this conference, gave a presentation. And I just thought it was so brave of him to do that. Uh, while I was at uh, Harvard, I met this guy, that's Martin Rocheck. This is my friend, Warren Siegel. And this is Professor Mark Grissero. Martin uh, was a graduate student when I met him. Uh, Warren was a postdoc, so he and I actually worked together on uh, some research papers. And Mark Grissero was a professor at Brandeis University. The work that Warren and I did uh, was, uh, at the time, was some of the deepest, most comprehensive mathematical work on a theory called supergravity. And so it caught the attention of people. Uh, and uh, as a, but, uh, but as I was leaving Harvard, my friend Ron McNair convinced me to apply to become an astronaut. And I almost did. I mean, if you can see, this is a web page that actually is a current, uh, currently in Germany. And they list uh, uh, biographies of astronaut and cosmonaut candidates. And as you can see, I'm there because uh, I, was, I really did, uh, in 1980, uh, consider um, becoming an astronaut, realizing uh, that childhood dream. But fortunately for me, NASA said no. Now, for most people, perhaps you know, that's a disappointment. But you see, by the time they said no, I had an offer to go to Caltech and work in the research group of Murray Gelman and Richard Feynman. And so for a young theorist, you know, that's just amazing. So I went off to Caltech. I spent two years there. And uh, here I am at Caltech, as you can see, still a f uh, unconventional, free-spirited young guy. I uh, worked really hard. Uh, had uh, It was two years uh, uh, in uh, Pasadena. And I met a number of uh, people I had taught in my previous life at MIT. So all in all, I got through the two years. But in the process, uh, I had some more mentors. And we were able, with Warren Siegel, uh, Martin Rocheck, and Mark Grisru to write the world's first mathematically comprehensive book on the subject of supersymmetry. So this decision I had made in 77 was beginning to show promise in terms of its impact on our field. Um, some of the people who were career mentors to me, well, Margaret McVicker, who was a professor at MIT, she was a person who really taught MIT that undergraduates uh, have a role in research. Uh, Vera Kistiakowski was my physics recitation instructor during my first, uh, first physics class at MIT. Dr. Shirley Jackson, the summer before I came to MIT, uh, taught me a physics class. And I will never forget, uh, I did took, a, uh, took the midterm in her class. I didn't do so well. And when I went to talk to her, uh, she was asking me what was wrong. And I was nervous. And then I blurred out, but I want to be a physicist. And her response was, oh, really? And I'll never forget the way she said that. But it, it, you know, it sort of bothered me, but it sort of also encouraged me uh, to work hard. The two gentlemen at the bottom of this picture, Carl Enigar, was my bachelor's thesis uh, advisor. I wrote a bachelor's thesis on a problem in acoustics, and he was uh, one of MIT's ex acoustic experts. And then finally, my PhD thesis advisor was Dr. James Young. Uh, Mark Grisru was my co-author. I showed you him in that picture with Hawking. But I met, had other mentors like Bruno Zamino. Bruno is one of the people who invented the subject of supersymmetry. And uh, he died about 10 years ago, but uh, I was a Compton lecturer at Berkeley. I'm sorry, I was the Oppenheimer lecturer at Berkeley. And um, it was during a period when Bruno was very ill. 
But he heard I was coming to give the talk and made one of his rare appearances on campus. I was extraordinarily honored that uh, this young kid that uh, he had written letters of support for, uh, uh, you know, decades later, uh, he had such regard that he would come to my talk. And I did, it was great just to see him one last time. And then Peter Van Nievenhuizen was also a big supporter. He's one of the people who started the theory of supergravity. At Caltech, these guys were the ones that supported my presence there. John Schwartz is the person who basically invented superstring theory, all popularly known as string theory, but the proper name is superstring theory because it involves supersymmetry. And then Murray Gelman was a Nobel laureate, of course, but Murray uh, was the person who had supported uh, John. And so Murray, uh, when John reported to these two kids at Harvard that knew a lot about the stuff that uh, he, he, the two of them were interested in, Warren Siegel and I were appointed postdocs at Caltech. And of course, I got a chance to meet the great Richard Feynman. He was an amazing guy. And uh, one day, if I ever get around to writing a biography, I'm going to tell some of my Feynman stories. But at Caltech, here's this book that we wrote, the first comprehensive book on the subject. Um, after Caltech, I went back to MIT as a faculty member in the applied math department. I stayed there two years and left because I didn't, I hated it basically. And I always believe that when you don't like something, you should do something about it. Another of my mentors was Abdus Salam. I, used, I spent about five consecutive summers uh, at the International Center for Theoretical Physics. Uh, I, at one point, um, Pilate, Italian, Pilate Italiano Un Poco, I used to have about a 300 word um, Italian vocabulary. And in fact, the first book I wrote for the public is actually written in Italian, although I had someone translate it for me. Um, so this is the research I was doing. It was, as you can see from the citations, we were getting some notice and it uh, put in place a firm foundation for my career. Um, but I've always been someone of my, of my own mind. Back in the early 2000s, when the LHC was being built, many people thought supersymmetry would be found there. I did not. And in fact, I explicitly wrote this article where I said I doubt that the LHC would uh, be able to find supersymmetry. Uh, for those of you know uh, about particle physics, you perhaps know that even to this day it hasn't been found. And that doesn't actually surprise me, because in this article, um, on the basis of a back-of-the-envelope calculation, I figured that uh, supersymmetry, uh, if it's to be found, uh, will be found in the region of something other than something great, 30 TeV or greater. And the LHC when it is even today nowhere near those energies. So this is perfectly consistent with my understanding uh, and intuition about the way the field works. What I said was, uh, you know, that uh, if you're going to look for supersymmetry, you should perhaps start by looking at precision measurements. And um, for those of you who follow particle physics, maybe you've been following the, some of the anomalies with the, uh, with the uh, um, magnetic moments of both the muon and the electron that may be suggesting that we're on the, on the verge of discovering some new physics. And this is perfectly consistent with the picture that I was trying to get people to understand back in 2006. So here's uh, the muon, discussion of the muon measurements. So what do I do? Well, I'm really kind of a, I tell people I'm a fallen mathematician because what I really do is I take, I look at the equations of, of supersymmetry and then I look for these mathematical structures. Maybe some of you have seen these pictures of quarks. So here's a typical quark picture. Well, uh, in the early 2000s, I and a guy named Michael Fox decided that there should be graphical representations of supersymmetry that have the same uh, kinds of uh, importance to the field that those quark pictures have. So in 2004, 2005, we developed a, a kind of translation between equations to pictures. And this was the topic of the cover story of um, Physics World uh, some in 210. Our idea is that um, if you want to study a physics that's complicated, there's probably some kind of a what we technically would now call a holography where you can study that theory by uh, looking at supersymmetrical quantum mechanics as opposed to field theory. Uh, here's a set of supersymmetry equations. And this is what the gra our graphs look like. So we know how to take the equations and translate them into graphs, retaining information about Lorentz representation, supersymmetry in these graphs. But we actually study the properties of the graphs. And uh, using these techniques, we found odd things like there's, there are error correcting codes at the basis of supersymmetry, a totally stunning result, which uh, to this day, we don't really know why it's true. 
Uh, we found other mathematical objects that were known before, such as this thing called a Bermudahedron. And we're studying the mathematical properties. These things are related to problems like the four coloring problem. If any of you are deep into mathematics, maybe the four color map problem will ring a bell. These are the kinds of things that we actually study in my work. And, uh, but on the other hand, you can teach computers how to make these graphs. And this is just an example of letting a computer make these graphs. They have a very artistic uh, appearance about them. And we have used them. So here's a set of equations that no, Nathan knows about these equations. Uh, but here's a set of equations about something called an 11-dimensional scale of superfield. It's related to a, a version of supergravity. And using these graphical techniques, and so here's a beginning with such a graph. It's actually 32 units tall. But using our graphical techniques, we're the first people to find that there's something called a graviton in that object that, that we just showed you. And we classified all the Lorentz representations. So these graphical methods are alternatives to the usual way that people study supersymmetry. But we're continuing to develop them to try to make some advances and to solve problems that have never been solved before. Uh, this is the kind of input we get, uh, output we get from our graph, uh, from our computer programs. I'm just showing this and done, just to show you. And the information we get is roughly speaking like looking at hydrogenic wave functions, but hydrogenic wave functions where there are 4 billion states. So it's a little bit more complicated. And of course, we do it with using computers. And I like to tell young people, learning to use coding is like putting on the math version of the Iron Man suit because it increases your mathematical power enormously. Uh, but I've also been in policy. So in uh, 2000, and been re uh, rewarded uh, with the uh, U.S. Medal of Science. So here's a picture of the US Medal of Science ceremony in 2013. I'm here. President Obama's there. Uh, when he uh, called me up to, uh, here's a picture of the Medal of Science. Uh, when he called me up to get the medal, he said, come get your award Sylvester because I had been advising him uh, by uh, let's say this is 2013 for four years and so we actually sort of knew each other uh, but no one calls me Sylvester but my wife and she only does it when she's mad at me so when he called me Sylvester I decided to tell him a joke I had made and you can see the result of that joke up here he enjoyed my joke so much that he giggled the entire time I was on the stage and made me very nervous but I've also uh, done work around diversity, starting in 1995, trying to understand uh, what is, what is, why should one care about diversity? And in this argument, I, in this article, I point out that um, that the reason you should care is for the why do you care about diversity anywhere? Look at science. What does diversity do? Well, diversity in genetics means a stronger gene pool. Diversity in, uh, in the production of food means having more, more uh, durable uh, grains that were developed. Diversity in music means look at the uh, wonderful diversity of music. So understanding diversity in the physical world is actually pretty simple and you can find out what its effects are. And so then you can begin to ask, do you see similar effects in human, uh, human activities? And that's why I threw in music at the end because yes, we do see the same effects. Uh, American rock and roll has had an amazing effect, effect on world music. Well, are we poor because of that? The answer is no. But suppose rock and roll had never come to existence. Suppose we only had classical music or samba. Name any genre that you like. But imagine World War. That's the only form of music that exists. Then you can begin to understand why diversity is important. So... From this, uh, I wrote a series of paper, uh, or essays, not a no, large number, but, at, and well, I wound up advising President Obama near the end of this time, and you can see some of our meetings in the White House. I also met the current president while he was vice president back in those days. And I, like I said, I wrote about why you should care about diversity in science from a point of view, not of justice, where most people want to make the social justice argument. My argument is, well, if you invest in a stock market, what does your advisor tell you? How about diversify your holdings? So if diversity is so good in all these other areas, why should it not be so good in innovation in science? That's the, uh, that's the question I raise with people. And I've done this uh, by talking about um, a decision uh, of the Supreme Court. This is a couple of years ago, 2016, as well as the current decision. And I'm going to say some more about that later. 
So since we're coming to the end, and, and Nathan, you asked me to leave some time for questions, let me just pop to the end. Um, most people don't really have a good sense of how racial dynamics has evolved in the West. And I'd like to point back to this thing called the doctrine of discovery, which was first articulated in 1452 by Pope Nicholas V as a papal bulletin, and um, also supported later by in 1496 by Ken, King Henry VII of England, where he made a patent grant to John Cabot which authorized and justified the destruction, killing, and appropriation of lands of indigenous peoples and nations. So at a time before the Catholic Reformation, you have the leader of Western Christianity uh, promulgating a document saying that only people who are Christian and of the European continent have fundamental rights. Now, um, I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to have that second paragraph twice, but it's emphasizing the same point. But the next point is that this was incorporated into U.S. law in the 19th century. When the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in a case of Johnson versus McIntosh in 1823, stating that European nations had assumed dominion over the lands of America upon discovery, and as a result, Native Americans had lost their rights to complete sovereignty as independent nations and retain only a mere right of occupancy. So this sets a framework for how in society and religion and law in the West, where we can see the beginnings of a theory of racial superiority. Now, what's really interesting is there's something else I'd like to point out to you. And that's to look at the Declaration of Independence of the United States of America and the Lincoln codicil to that document. The Declaration in 76, 1776 states three basic ideas. God made all, made all men equal. People have certain inalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the main uh, business of the government is to protect these rights. And individuals have a civic duty to defend these rights for themselves and for others. Now, this is the Declaration of Independence before the United States has actually been formed as a political entity. Uh, in 1863, in the middle of the Civil War, uh, Abraham Lincoln re resurrected the promises of the Declaration of Independence, recalling how the nation was conceived in liberty and dedicated the proposition that all men are created equal. Now, so if you stop and think about these two documents, this is actually very interesting because the doctrine of discovery says not that certainly it's not true that all persons are created equal. Whereas the Declaration of Independence takes exactly the opposite viewpoint. And Lincoln, uh, during the Civil War, uh, uh, point, uh, well, right after the Civil War, supported the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments that ended slavery wrote the Declaration of Independence uh, promise commitment to freedom and equality into the U.S. Constitution because the Declaration is not part of the Constitution, it's a separate document, and promised to ban racial discriminating and vote, discrimination in voting. These amendments sought to make Lincoln's new birth of freedom a constitutional reality. And so in the United States, we can see this very interesting pushback on the doctrine of discovery, which is only a certain subclass of humanity has rights, where the, at least in spirit, the Declaration of Independence says, no, all humans have these rights. All humans have equal rights. And so in my country, uh, we can see this battle between these two competing ideas play out in the history of our country from the Civil War to the Reconstruction, uh, to the Jim Crow period. And now we've entered a new period where the political conservatives in our country have pushed the United States away from this point of view that Lincoln had and more closely aligns with the point of view of the doctrine of discovery. Now, people don't say this. This is not something that's said out loud. But since I, I believe we each have the right to use our minds and look at the information that's coming in, this is what I see. 
And so the U.S. is now in what I'd like to call the Robertsonian Supreme Court era. Does it mean that it's going to reprise the, what happened in the end of the 1860s and the Reconstruction period? Because uh, right after the Civil War, African-Americans were voted into Congress for the first time. And there was a flourishing of African-American entrepreneurship and businesses. And these were all destroyed in the 1890s with the uh, election of a president and with the withdrawal of the Northern troops from the Southern part of the United States. Is this going to be, uh, um, uh, is this going to be a preview of the future? I don't know, but I lay these facts out for people to think about. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jim, for, uh, for sharing your history. It was really amazing, <laughs> very touching, very moving. And uh, I think it's, uh, it gives us a framework of thinking about uh, racism, about discrimination, about non-inclusiveness uh, from a p historic perspective. Uh, and, uh, and to realize that it's really deeply, uh, in, it's deeply included in, in, in our culture and it's very difficult uh, to reverse. But I think uh, in the, talking about science or physics in particular, that's why we're here and this is why uh, the, 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 the movement with women and all what we've been doing and also now with inclusiveness is so important. But thank you so much. Uh, let's, um, uh, let's open the floor for, for questions to, to Jim. I, question? I have a question. No, there you are. I have, a, I have a question, Jim, because uh, a, a very strong component of your, of your career was uh, the encouragement you got from your family. And, uh, and this, is, this is important. I mean, it also resonates uh, for, uh, to some cases, uh, to cases of women in physics, for example. They always mention how important the family was, which is very important. But uh, in spite of the uh, antagonistic environment, you, could, uh, you were able to, to thrive tr through and to have this excellent career. How nice it would be to imagine to dream about every uh, single child uh, to have equal opportunity to reach the degree of understanding you got uh, of, the, of the physical world. Uh, that would be <laughs> so, so nice. So my, my question is um, um, how important, so the, the, um, how do you see the situation now uh, in the US, uh, because I suppose different regions are, are different, but how do you see the situation now in the US with black communities or with, of, or with other communities with respect to their families, their culture and uh, different policies. Is there, are we lacking that? Just very briefly, tell me how you see it. Sure. Thank you, Karen. Um, as you noted, and I always do this, in telling my story, I always start from my family because it's completely clear to me thinking about uh, what I've, my getting my dreams to come true, that without the foundation that my, especially my father, Lee, uh, I, my life would have been completely different. Uh, my grandfather was a sugarcane farmer uh, in Alabama, uh, and uh, he had dreams that his son, my father, would, would take over the farm. But my father said, no, I, I can make a better life for myself. And that's why at age 17, he joined the U.S. Army in the middle of the Second World War, was to make that better life. And uh, he, so he laid that foundation where I could start to dream Without that foundation, if we were struggling for food and survival, there's no space for dreams in such a struggle. And so family is, like I said to me, I, it's absolutely important. Now, unfortunately, in the United States, um, our society doesn't support families very well unless you have money. Um, if you have money, you can support your family. You can you can send try to struggle and get a good education for your children. And my wife and I, my wife is a medical doctor, and we had to struggle to get a good education for our kids. And so imagine people who don't have these kinds of uh, financial means to uh, get such an education. The typical African-American family in the United States has about an eighth of the wealth of the typical European-American family. Now, you might say, well, so what? Well, so what turns out to be, if you look at how schools are funded in the U.S., they're funded for what are called property taxes, and property taxes are based 
on the value of the homes that you live in. And so if you then look at the average American African-American child and look at the funding for their school, that difference is going to show up. And so when people talk about qualifications and merit, what do they mean by merit? Do they, do they mean by merit my parents were wealthy enough to send me to a, a school where I could get a decent education? Or is merit something more than that? Is merit the, perhaps the promise that someone who has been not so well educated, maybe a little bit like me, can make contributions that you wouldn't expect to happen? And so that's what we see in the African-American com community. And the decision of the Roberts courts is simply going to sustain that disparity and continue to make it different, is my prediction. Now, for other cultures, it's different. Uh, most of our, for most, but not all, of our Asian American uh, colleagues, we see um, a lot of evidence that those families have figured out a way to negotiate racism because there is anti-Asian racism in this country, just like there is anti-African American racism. Those, those, they seem to be doing better. Our Hispanic American colleagues, it's a mixed picture. It uh, depends on which part of the community you look at. If you look at Cuban Americans who are considered Hispanic, they're doing pretty well. But you look at some of our groups like Mexican Americans, it's a very different story. And so it's a complicated social environment here for families. And there are no quick fixes that, I, that I'm aware. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jim. Here, here we have a, up there we have another question. Uh, but just before you ask, I invite those who are watching us through uh, Zoom uh, to, to ask questions also if they want, and Jandira is collecting the questions so then we can also have the participation of our Zoomies. Yes. Okay. Hi, Jim, uh, thank you for your presentation and sharing your story. I'm from Peru, from Argentina, so Sorry if I, my question, I, I'm not sure about, I mean, I don't know the, the American culture that much, so sorry if my question are a little bit like bias. But uh, one thing I've been in the state, um, one question that I have is that sometimes I feel, only for my experience in the state for a couple of uh, months, that black community in science there in the state, like they're like, like together, like segregated, they, separate from the rest of the people. And even though that, I mean, the USA has had a, a black president, and I'm pretty sure that you have some like um, inclusion policies, and you have like better situation than many other countries that here in Latin America. Um, and I feel like it's it just caught my attention. Why, do, why don't, why don't you think that in American like culture, we don't, like, you don't kind of like, have like more like inclusive like community, but when black people and white people can actually, I don't know, like get together in fact. That's one of my question. The second question I have is, I've seen like in the last 20, 20 years maybe, uh, there's like there's like a trend that you have to be like diverse and inclusive. And it's like, sometimes you don't know if the people they do it because they know they have to do it or because they truly believe it. And of course, you, sometimes you become the only black people or the only brown people in the area and you're, you're tokenized. And, and also see that uh, I, I, in the in last, um, maybe two or three months ago, I read an article, I don't remember what's in a very like, famous American uh, media, that some uh, top universities in the state was trying to like, uh, some people in those universities was saying that, oh, you have like, uh, some position exclusively for like Latin Americans or black community, and you're discriminated white people. And I heard some that some there was some kind of discussion, and I feel like some that in the last five or ten years there's like a movement that is trying to go to going back. And for example, in my case in Argentina, this like now we we have like elections in national elections in the in this this week this weekend. And I feel like there's a strong movement, I mean, who really thinks about inclusion and diversity, but also there's an, the opposite, like, movement that is race, that is race uh, increasing. And I don't know why, it's, why the, the world is kind of, like, getting, like, um, bipolarized, like, get, getting divided in two. And I, I don't know why, <laughs> I feel like... What we're is your question? <laughs> we're, impro we're improving, and at the same time, there's, there's, like, the opposite force, like, emerging and getting even stronger voices right now. That's just, just an, an opinion. Okay, so I agree with your analysis. Um, but the other thing is, in some sense, 
I'm not surprised at all. Um, one of the things that is a hobby of mine is history. And uh, if you know enough history, um, you could see that the, in the United States, that the progress that was made in the 60s, and there was tremendous progress, I'm part of that progress. I probably would not have been admitted to MIT if I had just graduated a year earlier than I did. But you could see, uh, especially since uh, the election of 1980, Jim, if you're if you listen if you're here, uh, you're frozen. So we're <laughs> we're trying to. Yeah, but he might hear. No internet. Uh. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, while while we wait, yes, we can discuss. Of course, uh, Yankee, yeah. Uh, for example, it was also created by some of Asian students because they felt that you know total number of students accepted to one university is a fixed. And if so, there were uh, the the you know some of the uh, Asian students uh, filed against uh, that uh, you know practice and etc. So it's not white, but <laughs> so it's it's. I'm saying this so we shouldn't just complain to uh, whites, but uh, Asians, uh, including myself, were also uh, uh, made that kind of complaint. So that that's uh, what the uh, universities are dealing very complicated situation. I agree with you that looking at uh, in U.S. and around the world, we feel that uh, we are going backward. In, in uh, and also we are sort of kind of a bad thing to be, we get encouraged doing, mimicking something, uh, the bad practice going to somewhere else, which is a very sad situation. Um. Um, yes, thank you for pointing those, those things out, because I mean, this posi the positive discrimination, when there is a, a transition period, uh, the same happened with women, I mean, some people don't agree. I do agree with those policies because it does help uh, in including. I mean, it's very difficult from well, the story we heard uh, from uh, from Jim. Uh, it's very difficult from from the family to try to struggle. I mean, he was strong. Uh, we women in physics, it was also hard. In I, I don't complain, but. Uh, and the situation is completely different, but several of us already also had a big encouragement from the family, but it, was, it wasn't easy to make you, so it, there's a cultural component that is very uh, important that we have to overcome somehow, but also positive discrimination I think is very important. Now this is why, I, I don't, I, I'm just talking, uh, or trying to see if there's anyone that wants to comment. Uh, I, ah, so, so this, is, this is why we're here to try to see, in addition to the effort that is done for women in physics or for gender problems, and to, uh, I'm, I'm glad to see also other efforts in uh, to being inclusive with inclusion to include others, uh, to, to include other, other underrepresented groups. Uh, okay, you, you had a question? No, 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 sorry, I just saw a hand. I'm trying to encourage people to say, but now I think we um, we have to pass to the other talk uh, by, by Valeria. Jim, Jim, are you back on? Can you Jim, Jim, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Ah, okay. So yes, okay. There you are. We, yes, maybe if you just wrap up, I mean, if you have something to say uh, from to re reply to that question, then we go to the uh, the next talk. Thank you. I just want to say thank you, and I, I I see we're over over the time limit, so I prefer to go ahead to the next speaker. And thank you all, and thank you, Nathan, for this opportunity. So hopefully we'll see you in the afternoon, right? Yes, I okay, plan right. to be back. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Jim. Yep, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Valeria, estás ahí? Valeria, are you there? Hola. Uh, hello, Valeria. Sí, hello. Uh, thank you. Thank you for being there. Uh, Va Valeria, as I said before, she's from Argentina. She's a co-founder of XSTEM. Uh, so it's to promote... Um, uh, to promote uh, more inclusion into STEM careers. So, Valeria, I understand you're going to speak uh, Spanish and uh, it's going to be translated uh, to some language. I don't know if uh, English or... Uh, to, uh, yes, English. I... So you're being translated into English, so I hope the AI program works well. So the floor is yours, Valeria. Thank you for being there. 
Thank you for the invitation. Eh, un placer para mí. Um, I prepare the, the presentation in English, my, my, but my English is not so good, so and I, I will speak in Spanish. Um, bien, bueno, muchísimas gracias. Un placer estar acá con ustedes. Me presento muy brevemente. Yo soy Valeria Viva, 